Welcome to another episode of the Two Heads podcast with me, Lorna Hackett and Michael Mansfield QC. In this episode, we talk about truth and evidence and the concept that truth means different things to different people. We also talk about truth in the context of law and evidence, as well as its wider context in society. We hope you enjoy the show. Okay, well, we've um, traversed stuff about truth and reconciliation and commissions and all those sort of models of achieving an element of justice all over the world, in fact, and it's been employed. So I've said before, at least 50 countries have tried this. However, we concentrated a bit more on reconciliation as the aspect of that. We didn't really develop truth and what that means and does it have a universal meaning? Does it have more than one meaning? I mean, how do you approach well, it? Well, could there be more than one version of the truth, depending on whether it's who's, who's viewing or who's telling the story of, of what happened, for example? So, um, yeah, I think um, we should develop the concept of truth and whether it means something for different things for different people and whether it matters. Yes, I mean, I think there is a, the truth about an event can obviously, I mean, the one that judges love to use, um, I'm not saying they've got it right, but it, it is an analogy that they use a lot about a traffic accident. So it's sort of kind of something that might happen to anybody, it is that there is one event. But what is that one event? Does it embrace the two cars and nothing more? Does it embrace the environment in which it happens and obviously people who witness it? Now, the people who do the witnessing have a very different perspective, each of them, depending on where they're standing and whether there's a lamppost in the way. And then you've got the people who are in the cars, they have a different perspective and sometimes you think are they talking about the same incident so it's the beginning of a process in which there was one there is one event but actually at the end of the day unless you're you know <clears throat> in the in the vein of various philosophers like Berkeley and so on you know it only exists if God sees it sitting in the square so um, that used to be the analogy that was used so is there one event that exists, but no one person has a grip on the whole event, so you get a number of different perspectives. And as you say, uh, does it matter to have the different perspectives? Well, um, I think it does matter that there are, as long as you appreciate that it is a perspective. And sometimes you can have one object, which I'll come to in a moment. You can have one thing which is sitting in front of you. The, the event is sitting in your lap. But even you sitting over there looking at it, me looking at it, through sometimes through the same microscope, mm -hmm. you see different things. So, um, I mean, this is only scraping the surface of it, but I mean, I don't know whether any of that resonates with your experience. No, absolutely. I mean, if, um, so for example, taking a, uh, a criminal trial, um, you have a situation in which the different witnesses de see different things, taking, for example, the, your analogy relating to a car accident. Um, and it's always an imperfect jigsaw puzzle. There are always missing pieces. It's just whether it, looking at it in the round, you can create the whole sense of a, of a picture or not, or whether the crucial pieces are missing. Yes, and I think a lot of that, the bits that are missing, comes from human frailty. In other words, you can have two people standing alongside each other and one will see one truth or aspect of the truth and the other will see another aspect. It may be, they may talk about the very same thing. Uh, for example, the colour of the car and people get very different results. One thought it was yellow, but I thought it was red, and it's, it's not. An experiment was done on this by, it's now been repeated many, many times, however, by a, a university lecturer who, doing criminology, decided he wanted to really shock his students. He certainly did. So he began the lecture, and they're all sitting there, you know. This is going to be another tedious lecture about statutes and legislation. And when he, he got started and he said, I hope you're all listening to this, because obviously they weren't really. So they're all banked up in their seats. 
and a door bursts open and a person runs across, fires the gu- a gun that he's got, blanks, but nobody knew that, fires the gun, electric, ah, ooh, falls down dead in front of them, and, and the gun person rushes off. Students, it's, it's been filmed. They don't know that, but it has been filmed. Students completely, you know, panicking, screaming, some transfixed, some whatever. And so after it's all over and it's died down and they realise it was a bit of a hoax, it had a purpose, obviously. They then interviewed everybody. And this has been done in many different ways to see how people react and what they say about what they think they saw. There's one event that we know, because we can watch it on the film. So you can see there was one event, but it's obviously a, it's made up of fragments, and this is going back to, to Bono and so on. So there's various things that are all happening. And some see something, some see other things. But when it comes down to the perpetrator with the gun, the gun person, I said person because mostly they thought it was a man. But actually, it wasn't. It was a woman. So all the perceptions they had, and actually, if you like, the prejudices they got about how this would happen, which door did the person, the woman, the gun woman, come in, go out? They all get it differently. How long were they in the room? Which way were they facing? So they're all looking at the very same thing, but they're all mostly very, very little consensus, except that lecturer gets shot. But where he got shot, in other words in his chest, face, whatever. They all get different versions of that too. Which means that, <clears throat> in a way, it's to do with observation. Do we walk around examining everything as if we're going to have to recall it in the next minute? Some of us are particularly observant and notice things that others don't. And I think, in a way, it goes back to the traffic accident, it goes back to everything else. In other words, to what extent are we alive to the things around us and the environment in which we live in a way that we interact with it and notice it for what it is and actually respect it for what it is. And and I think that leads into all the eyewitness problems that you get with people who see what they want to see. Well, and, and I suppose picking up on that, you also have the problem of people putting their own prior experiences and their own slants and their, their own bias on the uh, on what they perceive. And so that creates a, 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 another reality, as it were, because they're putting their own prior knowledge or their own uh, perceptions that they had before the event onto what they then perceive it to be. Well, that's quite interesting because, well, I think it is anyway, is that in the days, not long gone, but anyway, in the days when I was regularly addressing juries, I always thought it was important because they're members of the public. The jury system is extremely important because they're bringing their own experiences, common sense and all the rest of it. I thought it, one way, I'm not saying it worked, but anyway. Well, there were two examples that I, I used to like to give to juries to see if they were awake. And, and judges sometimes sort of half listen for what's he up to now. And what, one of the... The stories I told was um, a story about a man, his dog, and a rabbit. And uh, uh, it comes to the weekend, and the man's family have gone off for the weekend, left him to look after the dog, a retriever, which I had once, and they're beautiful dogs, but they're p- pretty inquisitive. And his neighbour was going away for the weekend and who had a rabbit. And the neighbour said, would you, would you mind looking after the house, just keeping an eye on my house? I'm away until tomorrow night, Sunday night. You know, I'll be back then, just keep an eye out. So the man said, sure, 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 no problem. Goes off. He's reading his newspaper w- with a window that overlooks the neighbour's garden. And when he's finished reading the newspaper, he puts it together and then... He looks up, where's, where's my dog? Oh my God, the, the retriever's next door. Not only is the retriever somehow got through the fence or over the fence into the neighbor's garden, he's got the rabbit by the throat and he's shaking it. 
So man goes, oh my God, cold shivers. Runs next door because he's got the neighbour's key to look after the house. He goes out and the rabbit's dead. Oh my God, what am I going to do? So he takes the rabbit back in. He brushes it off, gives it a shower, brushes it up, gets the fur up, takes the rabbit back to the hutch, props it up, shuts the door, goes back inside. Waits for Sunday night. Neighbour comes back, a lot of clattering, doors banging. After a, not a very long interval of time, his own front door's going and the neighbour's there looking like death warmed up. You know, and he asks the obvious question, you know, have, you, have you been, I asked you to look at you know, on my house. Well, I, I, yeah, anything happened to, uh, but, uh, not, not, not much, no. He said, the strangest thing has happened. Oh, God. Yeah, the rabbits come back to life. <laughs> I'm going to ruin it, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. And the jury sometimes do the same because they're getting there. Because, of course, the, the, the rabbit wasn't dead. And the man thinks he's got the, the second coming for a rabbit. And what you're saying to a jury is you, you put on to a set of events because it's a retriever, it's your dog, you're supposed to be looking after a rabbit. You don't know, so you think the worst. You think the dog has killed the rabbit. The rabbit, in fact, had been buried and the dog dug the rabbit up. There are lots of very similar stories to that, but there are, there's one other one where uh, Sherlock Holmes goes on a camping trip with uh, Watson and they set up the tent they go off to sleep in the middle of the night. Um, Sherlock looks up and he taps Watson on the shoulder. He said, he, he, he said what, do you, what do you make of the sky? And so Watson says, oh, it's a bit dark, that's all. He said, well, you know, you can tell a lot from the sky, you know, if you look up. And he said, yeah, you can tell the time horologically astronomically where we are in the world, we can work out our position. And so Sherlock says to Watson in the end, is there anything else you've noticed, you know, about the sky? He said, no. He said, well, where's the tent? <laughs> Somebody nicked the tent in the middle of that. And it's just, it's just slightly twe tweaking what you normally, you know, you ask, it's the lateral thinking point again, but set up in a, a vaguely humorous context so that, you engage somebody just for a second so they begin to see what it is that you want them to do. And then the other one I use is the elephant in the room, which is a Banksy analogy of a, an, uh, where he had an exhibition with an elephant in the room, which he painted in the same colours as the wallpaper. And he did it in um, San Francisco, I think, and Americans came in and said, wow, what a wonderful room, but nobody noticed the elephant. You know, it's that kind of thing. So it's the elephant in the room analogy. I think that's quite important in terms of um, the alertness and the awareness of the surroundings in which you are. Mm. And uh, I think, and also it bears upon um, a much more detailed analysis. So that's how you might ask a jury to look at an event. But then if you get, I, I just wanted to, to talk a bit about forensic science because it comes into all this. Can I stop you though? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> on, well, yeah. I was going to say, on the basis of the story about the Labrador and the uh, and the dead rabbit, wouldn't the Labrador have been convicted? Because oh, I see. If the <laughs> <laughs> only you could think of a Labrador on trial. <laughs> it's like an F. Simpson, these amazing plays which he wrote, <laughs> extraordinary. Well. And Peter Cook played the part of a judge, and all the all the witnesses were dead, and the first witness came in a, in a coffin. And <laughs> so, what, you need to have this weirdness about so if the if the dog was on trial yeah yes well don't you think the dog would have been convicted yeah i do too wouldn't that have been a terrible miscarriage of justice yes mm. uh, and and of course it would be dependent on maybe the owner and not telling the truth uh because he's not going to own up the rabbit was dead for all sorts of odd reasons because people tell lies for all sorts of reasons sometimes far far removed from uh, altruistic motive. So, um, yes, and, uh, and, and, uh, and the dog can't speak much and not very articulate, so yes, there is a risk. Yeah, I mean, and that wouldn't... sort of miscarriage, uh, if, if you like, where pe facts get distorted, assumptions are made, runs through a lot of the early miscarriages, some of which, well, some depended on false confessions, 
but some depended on forensic science. I'd just like to take a moment now to mention our amazing sponsors, Clio. As I'm the head of legal practice at a law firm, I'm always looking for ways to become more efficient, to save time on administrative tasks and to keep track of client contact and matter management. And I have to say, Clio allows me to do all of this and so much more. At Hackett & Dabs, we've been using Clio for about the last 18 months and it has been absolutely brilliant. Importantly, it allows me to free up my valuable time to devote more to my clients and to the matters that I am so passionate about, like social justice. Clio offers really great customer service, flexible contracts and a free trial so you can try out their software before you buy. They're also really nice people who are totally committed to achieving access to justice for all in society, including the most vulnerable. In short, I would recommend Clio to any lawyer or law firm. To see for yourself why I'm so pleased with them, visit www.clio.com forward slash UK forward slash two heads. That's www.clio.com forward slash UK forward slash two heads. And now back to the show. And what interested me in the very early days, and still does to this day, especially as you get government saying, they want to follow the science, you know. So what is science? Well, we know the meaning of the word uh, to know about knowledge, accumulating knowledge, <clears throat> but obviously in a particular way now. And the, the problem with forensic science, and there is one, is the concept of being clinically objective. And I've always doubted the extent to which you can have true objectivity. Now, this is all to do with perception again, only this time it's to do with the analysis of inanimate objects as opposed to eyewitnesses, um, trace evidence left at the scene. It might be a fingerprint, it might be t human tissue and DNA, uh, or it might be hair uh, and so on, that's left where you've been sitting. So when you leave that chair, you don't, in one sense. There'll be a bit of your red dress and maybe... Um, some fibres and fibers. probably some hair and, and, and some and, Yeah, one, one of the many hairs you have there. Thank you. That, that could be left. So, so then that's collected. And of course, once you begin to see the process, you begin to realise it's not quite as the judges used to say, oh, well, you know, it's mathematical. They come up with a mathematical truth. Two plus two equals four members of the jury and it can't equal five. As if to say... The forensic scientist has it all in the palm of his or her hand, which they, that was the original approach until they began to realise not quite as simple as that. So the, the first case, yes, almost the first case I ever had, uh, revolved around forensic science. It revolved around handwriting, not so common these days um, because it's... DNA and actually, obviously, digital matters rather than fingerprint, uh, fingerprints and handwriting. But this was handwriting. And it concerned a, a signature on a false passport. So uh, uh, the person I represented, who I'm not going to name, was uh, alleged to have written it. So the question was, is the handwriting on the false passport of my client? Now, in those days, the prosecution would involve one scientist the defence would have another. The two scientists would know each other because they nearly always were on opposite sides of, of, of the courtroom. The defence scientist would know that he's being brought in to challenge the comparison and the other one would know that he's being brought in to um, accentuate the commonalities between them. I come along straight out of Professor Flew's philosophy lesson and uh, we did the philosophy of science. So I said, well, this is, can't be right. You, you can't do it like that. Can you? And all, all the elders of statesmen of the legal profession would say, go back to bed. You know, this is not... We don't do it... Because what I wanted to do is to say, the only process which is even remotely objective is you do not tell the scientist... Well, you probably have to tell them which side you're on at the end of the day, but you must not tell them 
which is the control, meaning the sample taken from your client, and which is the suspect that found at the scene, wherever. You don't do that. You put those two are on show. Well, actually, you don't even tell the scientists that they're there. You're saying one of them might be a control. One of them might be. that They don't know. But you collect, let's say, 12, like 12 jurors, 12 examples of writing. So in the particular case I had, I got a relative of the person I represented to do the same signature and then some other people to do the same signature. And I you know, got somebody who I thought would write similarly. And so there was a range of 12. And I remember approaching the solicitor, first of all. He, he was quite keen and, and thought that this was a novel idea. He said, how are we going to pay for this? I said, I don't know how you're going to pay for it. But I said, scientifically, that's the way you've got to approach it, in my view. And of course, I'm fresh out of, I've not even been at law school. I'm fresh out of everything. So this became as a bit of a shock. And then the judge got wind of it and said, you, you, you we're not having public money spent on this. I said, all right, make it to three experts or whatever. And maybe I'll halve the number of whatever. But we did, we did, we went through the experiment. First of all, the experts didn't want to know because it's putting them to the test in a way they've never been tested before. So they're all going hands up. No, no, we don't do it. Now. Anyway, eventually, eventually, eventually. And of course, it won't surprise you, none of them agreed on which was written by whom. Least of all that it was written by, you know, um, the person I represented. There was real division of opinion. Some did think it was written by her, but some others didn't, equally strongly. And what it taught me was that forensic science is not, hasn't got that objective stamp on it. It's actually highly subjective because of what the framework in which you see something. And this approach applies to fingerprints and it applies to DNA. Because the various stages, let's take DNA as an example. If you committed some offence or something in that seat, and I found all the things we've talked about, it, it, and I was trying to trace DNA, that's at the other end, the actual comparison with your actual DNA. But look at the stages it's gone through before. Fact is, other people have sat on that seat as well. So there's other people's DNA on that seat. Plus, it's got to be packed up by somebody who may not have packed it up. It may have got contaminated. It may not have been sealed properly, the sample. And all the way through the various stages in which there is a human intervention which can skew an eventual result which has to be compared. And so uh, I got a situation in which there is a, a, an expert, I think he's still around, called Dr. Draw, who... Um, came to see me in chambers because he was, he was experimenting with perception. Mm -hmm. And he'd shown that fingerprinting, particularly, he, he did an experiment in which old cases were opened up, but they weren't, the new experts brought onto them weren't told they were old cases where there'd been a conviction and said, you know, can you compare these fingerprints? He got, as I did with handwriting, mm -hmm. an array of results. That's not to say that forensic science it is, you know, uh, to be discarded. It's just to say it's not infallible. And I think, personally, like all good art, it's in the eye of the beholder, a measure of it. So you have to have that sort of ability to do that. Think, think you know, in other ways about the same thing. And it's a bit like, I'm going to show it, because I brought it. <laughs> um, I've always been interested in illusions, but they're not illusions, really. This one picture, which I think you can see from there, I'll lean forward if you can see yeah. it. It's a well-known picture of a... looks like a vase, but actually, of course, as you look at it, it, it is a vase, but it's also two faces facing each other. And I've got another one, which is far too complicated to show in detail on the screen. It looks like a young... Or it looks like a woman, mm -hmm. but there are two women in this one. A younger woman looking away and an older one looking down. But trying to find the faces isn't always easy because you're, you're putting onto it all sorts of conceptions and perceptions that you've got yourself. And that's, in a way, what's happening 
was happening and still does to some extent in forensic science, although the scientists are now becoming more aware of the fact that in order to uh, reduce, minimise the subjective element that is undoubtedly there in the process, in order to, as it were, safeguard the ultimate result, whether it's a fingerprint comparison or a DNA one, then you've got to have a process which is almost sacrosanct. And we're approaching that, but we haven't quite got to it. So I've always had the sort of uh, 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 a desire to ensure that, you know, the other side is probed and that when I first started, nobody questioned forensic science. It's as though that once the white coat came into the witness box, not literally, but metaphorically speaking, then, you know, that was it. And uh, early judges say, Mr. Mitchell, are you, are you suggesting? And I was saying, you know, what's that? Until I had one expert who came and done refractive glass indices. Well, I didn't understand any of it, but... What's that? Exactly. <laughs> when you stick your finger in a glass of water, which I won't do, it bends because yeah. it's the light impacting on the water. Um, so it's to do with a bit of glass found in a bank robbery in the turnips of a trousers... If anybody wore robbers wearing turnips, they don't anymore. They all go in in shorts. But I mean, it's it's it was that. And you've asked this scientist to come here with a sample of the glass. I said yes because I've got some questions. Anyway, <laughs> this scientist came in with one of his old Home Office briefcases, which he opened the flap, and you see he opened it up, and he goes, "Oh, it's funny." He said, uh, "And so the judge said, hey, do you have the sample there?'" So I just said, yeah, I, I, I did have. <laughs> yes, I think. Is it, has it fallen on the floor down there? And it, he had a file in which the glass was. The file had dropped on the floor and it hadn't been sealed properly and the actual sample disappeared. So the judge, the judge was getting very worried at this stage that the actual sample at the centre of the case could no longer be found and it couldn't be verified because... One of the other principles of science is you say your dress is red, I say it's blue. Mm -hmm. To verify that, you, get, you have to have a process in which I can be shown to be mad, that's not difficult, and, 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 and somebody else can come along and say, well, I can look at that, it's obviously red, I don't know what he's talking about. And it's inter-verifiable. But that, that is another, this is looking for the truth, because that's what we're trying to examine here, how do you get to the truth? And, of course, when I, I, I... I'm not saying I introduced it, but I remember raising this concept of interverifiability in terms of forensic science. And, you know, members of the Court of Appeal would look over their pince-nez at me and say, into what? And, you know, I say, inter, you know, and, and the verifiability. And, of course, it makes sense that you have to have um, a, a sort of a qualitative test which in the United States they do have a special test uh, for reliability because that, you have to examine truth in that sort of light. Is it the kind of material on which you can be sure, before you convict, that th this is, if you like, a stepping stone to truth? And I think, you know, looking at our daily lives and the kind of situation we're all in now, which is fake news, how do you know what you're being told is the truth? How do you? Well, you don't. And then, of course, <laughs> you can look at one of those fact check websites and then wonder whether they also have their own agenda. So, you know, and there's also a difference between, I think, um, stating a fact as it is perceived to be and then making an assumption that that fact then correlates with the other. So, for example, the fact that I'm sitting on this chair and there might be DNA and hair samples doesn't necessarily mean that I've committed the crime. But you could put, oh, put the two point, together. Yeah. Um, or this chair, I, I might not have been here at all, the chair might have been moved to another place, or there could have been evidence planted on the chair to suggest that I was here. Yeah, all of that. <laughs>